Welcome to the My Friend the Friar podcast, and thanks for listening. If you like My Friend the Friar and want to support us, please consider subscribing or following us if you haven't already done so. And if you found us on YouTube, then don't forget to click the notification bell when you subscribe so you'll be notified of new episodes when they release. Thanks again, and God bless. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me and my friend, the Friar. Father Stephen Sanchez, a discalced Carmelite priest. Good afternoon, Father. Good afternoon. It's always weird when it's not good morning. I don't know why. Yeah, you have to think about it, yeah. Yeah. All uh, right. Uh, we're continuing our conversation about our mother, Mama Mary. Some people call her. BV, BVM. Yes. Um, we Last time we got through kind of the historical nature. A lot of this is still historical, but like the kind of ancient history part of this. Um, kind of her, her, her story in the church. And we're picking back up today at Vatican II. There's nothing pre Vatican yes. II today, yeah. correct? Correct, correct. All of it, all of it has to do now with uh, <clears throat> the council, right? So <clears throat> there's only, excuse me, there's uh, four Marian dogmas, right, that, that we are called to believe in, right? One that we talked about in the last episode was about the divine maternity, right? The, the Theotokos, which is mostly really about Jesus yep. right? and Mary secondarily, because it's about the... Jesus being true God and true man. And then there is the perpetual virginity, which has always been part of the church, right? There's no there's no declaration. It's just part of the church, and it's something that we're called to believe in. Yep, yep. The perpetual virginity of Mary. There is the immaculate conception that was declared in 1854. And then there is the assumption of Mary that was declared in 1950. So those are the four dogmas, <laughs> right? So... So the Second Vatican Council and Mariology, right, Uh, or we should say a Christological Mariology, uh, Mary within a correct understanding of salvation history. Yes. So when John the Twenty Third announced the council, there was a lot of uproar. There was a lot of um, a lot of belief that it was going to be a council on Mary, right? Because John the 23rd announces it surprised everybody because again he was he was a uh he was an interim pope and he was an old man and they didn't think he was gonna last long so it was just okay we couldn't pick they didn't vote for anybody else they picked john and so he announces to the surprise of everyone including the curia everybody in rome that he was going to convene a council and he declared it while he was in loretto which is a, a marian shrine and that the council would be convened on October 11th, 1962, which used to be, in the old calendar, the Solemnity of Mary, the Mother of God, uh, the Theotokos, right? So everybody just assumed that it was going to be a council on Mary. So this is the surprise of everybody, and it was not. So the, um, the rough drafts, what they called schemas, the schemas that were prepared ahead of time by the commissioned uh, committees. The council was evenly divided as to where to insert the chapter on Mary when it came to the whole, this rough draft, where are we going to talk about Mary? And it was very divisive and it was very emotional. I mean, according to some of the journals of people that, that were at the council, that was probably the, the hottest debated topic and the most emotionally uh, reactive topic was Mary. Again, and it goes back to the whole idea of, that I said before, you know, you're talking about mama. And so like, okay, now what you doing about talking about my mama? <laughs> and so you have, you have people that are responding emotionally and you have people that are trying to teach from a theological and philosophical stance, right? So you have these two different approaches, which caused a lot of... Uh, yelling and screaming <laughs> yeah at the, at the council so so i, I didn't I, i'm not super good in my modern church history so 
Pope John the Twenty Third, he called the Second Vatican Council. Is that what he called together? Yep. Okay, so this is yes. yeah. They're talking about obviously lots and lots and lots of stuff, and then there's just this right. one. So was the whole thing really divisive, or just necessarily the Marian? It was the Marian, which is the most divisive, right? It was divisive in that you were changing. There hadn't been a, a real council. The, the first Vatican Council was cut short because of the World War. Mm -hmm. And so they never really finished the first Vatican Council. But before the first Vatican Council, it had been like several several hundred years yeah. before council, right? So you have a lot of stuff to, to discuss, right? So one of the things that... The, happened at the council is that the pope declared mary the mother of the church and that was against the desire of the majority of the bishops right the, the majority of the bishops did not want that to happen but the reason he did that was there was a minority of bishops who threatened to walk out of the uh, council if he didn't do that Right. If he didn't, they were sort of like a like holding him ras rans like holding him a hostage. Right. So they were ransoming the the council, and so he needed to declare Mary, mother of the church, to keep the minority from walking out. And the reason he declared Mary the mother of the church is that this minority had wanted a complete separate constitution on Mary, and he said no. He said. Mary's going to be within the people of God, and th which is theologically correct, right? Yeah. So, uh, in Lumen Gentium uh, is where we have now in uh, this, the councils of the Second Vatican, uh, the documents of the Second Vatican Council, excuse me. In Lumen Gentium, we have a couple of chapters on Mary, and it's within the people of God. So, when you go to Lumen Gentium, the chapter on Our Lady is a very balanced presentation of Mariology. Those are chapters 7 and 8 in Lumen Gentium. And so what they do is you have, during the council, they had all these experts. The, they called them Paredes. They had all these Paredes come and teach, give classes to the bishops. Classes on scripture, classes on Christology, classes uh, uh, just basically teaching the bishops the latest theology and the latest philosophy, right, developments and stuff, and the history of these developments, right, to help them understand what they were doing at the council and how they needed to proceed, right? So what the council does is it returns to the primary sources, scripture, tradition. It eliminated most of secondary sources or apocrypha or legends, right? So the council then connects Mary within the role that she plays in connection to Jesus, to, again, salvation history. So then in Lumen Gentium, Mary is presented within the community of belief. It's an ecclesial presentation. Mary is part of the church. In this veneration of Mary, it looks to Mary as someone to be imitated, not just venerated in terms of... Uh, yeah. Is that sort of like preeminent, you know, all those multiple titles that we talked about last time, you know, just piling more and more titles on her. And so Mary is presented as a faithful disciple, someone to be imitated. It also presents in uh, the eschatological, we talked, remember that word? The eschatological, the eschaton, the end of all things, mm -hmm. you know, the, the coming of Christ in glory, which is we're all trying to get to that point. So in Lumen Gentium, it also presents Mary in this eschatological tone. It envisions Mary within the perspective of hope. She is the first of the church to be enjoying the fullness of, of glory. She has a resurrected body. She is enjoying the beatitude, right? And she, as the first of the community, then intercedes for us and waits for us to join her and the rest to be part of that communion, that, that final communion, that final uh consummation right in with that encounter with christ with the trinity uh through christ and, and it's also ecumenical and the ecumenical tone is that it sees mary as a help of uh, dialogue with others right because she 
is then this ideal Christian, the ideal disciple. And sometimes for other <laughs> faith traditions, mm -hmm. it is Mary is an obstacle. And sometimes it's the Catholic fault because we kind of sometimes there are Catholics that over that are overly Marian and just overboard right in yeah. their Marian devotion, right? And is a little skewed in their presentation, and so it's that can be an obstacle. But the again, the Lumen Gentium or the Second Vatican uh, Council documents presents a much more theological uh, based understanding of who Mary is. And as we said the last episode, this understanding of Mary, Mary, has been growing and developing over centuries. I mean. As we said the other day, this is this is a development of something that's been going on within the heart of the church that finally needed to be defined, right? And to keep people from uh, having a misunderstanding or a skewed understanding uh, of Mary or making Mary more than, than than a creature that she is, right? Yeah. So, in relationship to Jesus, she she's associate she is an associate to Jesus in the work of salvation. She's not equal to Jesus. She's not what they call a parallel entity, right? And so we talked about that y the other day, too, in terms of, you know, like, kind of like going to mom when I get, can't get something out of dad. Yeah. And so they're trying to clear up that theology, too, that, that misunderstanding of Mary as, as this um, way of getting something out of God, right? Mm -hmm. If I can't get it from God, I'll get it out of Mary, right? Yeah. So, so kind of put trying her... To correct that. Kind of putting her into... Um, appropriately, uh, she's like any other saint. Um, maybe in mm -hmm. a special place because you know she's yes, Jesus's mom because of her <laughs> right and her role, and her, her yeah. unique role. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a very unique creature, but a creature. Yeah, and and unique is he, like there's lots of unique people. All the apostles were all unique, right, in their role, right. But it doesn't mean right. that they're somehow right. like special. Right, so maybe putting her right, right, right. more in lines with that. Do you know who these um, these teachers were? Because you would think the bishops would be educated enough to teach. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, what well, I mean. Well, for the Peretti, you had uh, you had like Carl Rahner, you had. Um, uh, of course, you would ask me. Well, uh, East Congar. Are, are, you, are they you like? Had, um, are they like? I don't know, uh, seminarian, uh, like theologian. Uh, yeah, theologians, the kind scholars, of people who would be scholars. formative anyway within the church, not necessarily. Yeah, so scriptures. Yeah, experts in in scripture, experts in liturgy, experts in uh, different experts, right? And so they were the ones that that came to to teach and to give classes and help the bishops come to a deeper understanding of of these different areas that they had, you know, the church hadn't addressed in generations right for example the whole liturgical movement began in the 20s in germany and france and and just the whole reform for liturgy mm -hmm. and the bishops have been asking for reform for liturgy since the 20s and the 30s as well right so it finally comes to to fruition in the 60s right so it wasn't like <gasps> like all of a sudden they, you know there's they liturgical changed reform. everything no the bishops have been asking yeah <laughs> the bishops have been asking for this for decades right yeah. But they needed to have experts to come and explain everything to the bishops, and this is the way it developed and stuff. Of course, most Catholics don't understand that, that, that there was a whole process uh, at the council. The council itself was a process that had been brewing for, for decades. Yeah, and I guess it's not uncommon either for um, historically for councils to have people that are not bishops to um, Correct. be like— experts in some areas right correct um uh -huh. and it, it, i mean i guess you think about my my first my, right my initial thought is oh they should know better they're the bishops right they're the they're the, the keepers of the faith but if you are very busy being a bishop i have a strange feeling you don't have a lot of time to go back <laughs> to, or continue to like go to school and learn all these kinds of things right go, go yeah yeah. yeah, go go to refresher courses at, at seminary. That'd be interesting, right? Yeah. yeah, but I guess there, it's there's a there's probably been a lot of changes since Vatican II, also on the what's expected 
uh, of the training and the education oh, yeah. of yeah. our priests and our bishops and stuff. Yes. So I, I would bet our the average yes. bishop today is probably much better educated than they were in the early 1900s. Oh, much, or... much, 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 much. There's been a lot, a lot of development, a lot of positive uh, things that have happened from come from the council, uh, even though there is a, a segment of the church that doesn't really understand what the council did or what the council was and is, right? Yeah. So, again, that's a matter of study. Right? It's a big family, too. It's kind of hard to... It takes it takes time. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah. It, again, and you have so much to do. Like, uh, like I've always tell people, like, there's two thousand years of history. Come on, you you can't know it all. So, yeah. you need to you need to go back and, and do some research or some study for yourself if you want. If there's an area that you're interested in, right? Mm-hmm. So before I say something about Mary and Lumen Gentium, I want to say a little bit uh, about Lumen Gentium too, right? So it is about Lumen gentium, light of the light of the world, right? Or gentium is people or nations. Lumen is light. So Christ is the light of the world. That's basically what the title uh, of this document is. But I want to just real quick, just a couple of, I'm going to cite some titles of some of the chapters uh, before we get to the one on Mary, just so that we understand, right? So the old councils always began with the structure of the church and it was always about bishops it always began with the bishops right so in lumen gentium which is the dogmatic constitution on the church right this is a a definition a self-definition the church is defining herself so chapter one uh that you know christ is the light of the nations but chapter one talks about the mystery of the church and so you from the mystery of the church, then you go on to chapter two on the people of God who you know, are within the mystery of the church. And then you go to chapter three, and in chapter three, you, they talk about the hierarchical structure of the church, which is about uh, the backbone of the apostolic succession and the bishops, the episcopate, right? We are, that is the the, the backbone around which the hierarchy or the structure of the church is built around the bishops, right? And they're as successors of the apostles. Chapter 4 talks on the laity, again, within the mystery of the church. Chapter 4 is on the laity. Then chapter 5 is on the universal call to holiness in the church. Everybody's called to the same holiness. There are not levels of holiness. There's not more holiness and less holiness. Everybody is called to the same holiness, right? We all have to strive for that. And then chapter 6, after holiness, talks about religious, which is, again, consecrated life. So after consecrated life, we go to chapter 7, which talks about the eschatological... <laughs> excuse me. It's a long day. The <laughs> eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and its union with the church in heaven. So here, okay, chapter 7, the eschatological nature of of the pilgrim church this is where mary is introduced Hmm. in this in the looking at the eschaton looking at the fact that she is part of that people right the the people that are already celebrating in the wedding feast of the lamb then we get to chapter eight chapter eight is entitled the blessed virgin mary mother of god in the mystery of Christ and the church. So you have this whole chapter on Mary, and then you have different sections on Mary. So real quick, uh, just a quick overview in terms of how it this kind of works out. Uh, so Mary is presented to us in within God's plan of salvation. So what do they do? So what does the the council fathers teach, right? Where they're starting their teaching from. First, they talk about creation, God's original design, right? That original justice that God wanted us to live in. And then they talk about the fall, right? The disobedience of Adam and Eve and original sin. And then within the fall, they talk about God's promise to Adam and Eve, right? That there will be 
a Messiah, right? Yep. And then after the promise, we have all these thousands of years of preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And then you have the incarnation, the arrival of the Messiah. And then you have the prolongation of the Messiah or Jesus' presence in the world through the sacraments, through the church, right? Yeah. And then looking forward towards that final encounter with Christ when he comes in glory, right? So this is the, the way that kind of sort of the whole teaching element then of uh, the Council Fathers, right? This is what they want us to understand or to know in terms of what's, what's happening, right? In terms of the understanding who the Virgin Mary is. And one of the things that, that they talk about uh, is also is the, the whole idea of the mystery of the Immaculate Conception. Now, in the mystery of the Immaculate Conception, what is happening here? We talked a little bit about this earlier when we, in the, er, the previous uh, episode uh, podcast, that for Mary to be the bearer of God, to be the Theotokos, she had to be pure, right? So how was she going to be pure? Well, she had to be prepared by God. So how was she to be prepared by God? Well, she would have to be free from original sin. She would have to be free from that concupiscence, that inability to, to respond wholly and freely to God's will. And so this is where we have the whole understanding of the Immaculate Conception, right? And the Immaculate Conception then means that Mary is conceived in the womb of her mother without the stain of original sin, which then means that Mary enjoys it to some degree that way of being before the fall, the original justice, because she does not have that, that weight of original sin, right? She lives in a broken world, obviously. She's surrounded by sin, just, you know, just as Jesus was, right? And so it's because she, has, she is immaculately conceived that she can respond wholly and freely to God's plan. Right. So this is some, something that, that we need to look at. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I would suggest for people to go and you don't have to go by the documents or anything. You can just go to the, to the Vatican website and just go to the documents of the Second Vatican Council and go to Lumen Gentium uh, or the Constitution, uh, uh, the dogmatic Constitution on the Church in the Modern World and go to Chapter 7 and 8, uh, 8 especially, which is on... Mary and just read that and again it, it's it's dense but there's a lot there that needs to be understood in terms of what the fathers are trying to teach us about the role of Mary in as we said earlier in the economy of salvation right yeah and it's um, I, and I love that it's all like as you're you're teaching me all these things a lot of it starts to make so much more sense. I might go read this document because I'm now I'm starting to get really curious about this stuff because, um, so she is, uh, preserved from sin by Jesus just at the moment. By, of the, by the merits, by the merits right. of the, uh, of, so the son was going to come into the world, right? Yeah. And so, and it's not like because some I've heard somebody go well it's like, it's it's you're trying to create these like Mary could God's taking away her free will right like he knew she was going to say no. so then she's des- no 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 so like this is all starting to make sense because if you were, if you existed kind of this uh, pre fall state yes then you're in relationship Original with justice. God and you're properly oriented yes. with God as as the the yes. focus of everything. So then why wouldn't you say yes to God? Yes. Yes. Right? She had the freedom to say no. She had the freedom to say no, but because she is, she, the the lens between her and God is not distorted as it is in our life, right? Yeah. Because of our brokenness, our sinfulness, our, our, even though we desire to respond fully 
we can't because yeah. of our brokenness, our our uh, our fallenness, right? Yeah. In Mary's case, she has the freedom to say no, but because she is oriented towards God and responds to God, she will say yes, not because she can't say no, but because she is free from sin, yeah. the brokenness, yeah. the selfishness of Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. And so that is why she's capable of saying yes, and that, and she can only say yes because the Logos or the second person of the Trinity was going to come into the world to redeem us. Yeah. And so this is the, Mary is the first to be redeemed before the crucifixion, before yeah. the passion, right? She is redeemed by the merits of Christ already. Yeah. I've, I've, I've heard someone else also say, it's, well, it's like God's cheating, right? He's stacking the deck in his favor or the cards in his favor, right? So like it's going to play out the way he wants, right? If he knows she's not going to say no, well, then he's just, you know, he's cheating basically, right? But what's funny about that is um, he, could God, uh, pu total purity, come into the world in an impure vessel? Sure, because he's God. He can do whatever he wants. Right. But mm -hmm. it makes sense. Right. The, the, it, you would that, you know, God himself would come into existence in a pure vessel. That makes sense. So it's like if yes. you it's like people just want to argue sometimes, you know, it's like if they if they think yeah. that he's wanting to cheat <laughs> or like stack the deck in his favor, then like, why couldn't he make a pure vessel for himself? People are looking for a reason to disagree, and they're yeah. not open to listening to the philosophy and the, the theology and the possibility of it. Okay, so Mary then is also then, what, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Okay, so she's already, that she is the true Ark of the Covenant. She is the true tabernacle, right? And so there is this, and Mary is, you know, in early, the early father said that Mary is the flower of the Anuim, the those who the pure of heart the, the poor of god right, right those who depend on god and so mary is sort of the flower of this waiting of israel and and so in this flower jesus then is the fruit of that and jesus himself is the anoim the fruit of the anoim he himself is all the beatitudes right poor in spirit and, and pure in heart and all those things right so if you would just, you know, people just stand back and look at the context and the the logic of this, like, well, yeah, yeah, that's possible. And how yeah. beautiful is it too? And why wouldn't God work in beauty? Right. 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 Hmm. So, I mean, for us, you know, the the Old Testament. Is, has always been a preparation of the coming of the Messiah, right? The, the virgin shall be with child, right? All this we look at and we see this, you know, that Mary, who is also the daughter of Adam, you know, also now becomes the mother of the new Adam. It, there's so much going on here. It's just it's like, oh, okay. So anyway, Please, please re read uh, yeah. chapter eight of Lumen Gentium, and I'm sure there'll be more questions that'll come from that because this is a really beautiful, beautiful uh, chapter on who Mary is uh, in the public life of Jesus as disciple, right? Uh, as um, as mother of the church, right? Uh, and the tr and the council it reiterates again. There's only one mediator, and that is Jesus. Yeah. So, but the maternal duty of Mary towards us does not obscure or diminish the unique med mediation of Christ. Somehow she is part of it. He wants her to be part of it. God wants her to be part of it. But she's not the mediator. There's only one mediator, right? So this is where the, that, that, that delicate balance has to be maintained, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think it's it's kind of so, interesting too how like so far this sounds like a pretty good compromise. If this if uh John the twenty third was like, What the heck did I get into here, right? Like I'm an old man, I thought I was gonna ride <laughs> off into the sunset. Now I've got to deal with all this. 
Like, it seems like he made a pretty good compromise. Yeah. Like, you guys are all mad for some reason, right? The, the majority. These guys are going to walk out. I have to maintain unity. So let's, why don't we let the Holy Spirit guide us and, and fix Guide this? us. Right. Right. Exactly. 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 Um, so then in the, in the documents then, uh, we have the, the, the perception or the way Mary is presented to us. And again, obviously she is mother of God, but that again, we, the as we said the other day, yeah. she's not a goddess. She, she's the Theotokos. It's, it's about Jesus. Mother of God is about Jesus, not about Mary. But Mary is an archetype. You know, she is presented, since the early church father, she has been presented as the new Eve. She's presented as the mother of Jesus of Nazareth, as, as his associate, right? As, um, a, as a disciple, as a follower. Uh, the wedding at Cana, they have no wine. So she intercedes for somebody in need, right? So she's presented to us in, in the documents here, in Second Vatican documents, as, as not just the mother of Jesus, but the mother of the church. She's presented as full of grace. She's presented herself as the new paradise because she is this, again, it, taking into consideration what the Immaculate Conception, just to sit with that and to ponder that is mind-blowing. Yeah what that means uh, and again she is the perfect example of, of Christ's redemptive work what we celebrate about Mary we celebrate we celebrate about the church we celebrate about the future church okay immaculate conception we're all called to be immaculate we're all called to be sinless God created us not with sin but sinless and so Mary is the image and the sign of that original design of God. And as we celebrate this image of Mary, what we're celebrating is not just Mary, we're celebrating our own future, our own immaculate state in the future. So it's it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful if people just step back and think it out theologically. Yeah. Right? Um, so Mary's presented as a woman of faith. Uh, she, you know, again, as she, if you look at Mary and think about Mary at the foot of the cross uh, as a woman of faith, I mean, for Mary to hold in her arms the dead body of her son, and in that moment of holding her dead son in her arms, for her to still have faith that somehow God is faithful. In that moment, there's still faith. In fact, in the Second Vatican documents, Mary is presented as having a faith greater than Abraham. And the first time I read that, I was going like, what? Wow, that is a huge statement to make, Yeah, that Mary's faith is greater than that of Abraham. And it says, I think about this, and I said, okay, this disciple, and this kenosis, again, this whole idea of emptying, right, this, this image of Mary as emptying herself as the father empties himself in the trinity to generate the son mary is emptying herself here as well to give us the son to uh, to give the son the humanity but also at the foot of the cross she in that emptiness she still believes she still has faith so this is something then that for me is is always uh, of great uh, consideration ponder is meditation contemplation right to ponder this right yeah something that's and, that's there's something as as one of my cats lenny just showed up and she's rubbing all over the microphone um something that betty always asks me about with mary and this so and as i'm listening to this now i'm i'm starting to think that she's um a asking the wrong questions maybe um so she she always wonders did Mary know what was going to happen, right? Did she, um, you know, when she became pregnant, I mean, Gabriel's, yeah. um, wait, was it Gabriel? Yeah. Which yes. I, yeah. He, so, you know, he, yes. he says what Gabriel. he says, but it's still kind of cryptic, right? So yes, she's like, so my wife is always like, did she know that Jesus was going to be the Messiah? Did she know 
that he was going to die to be the Messiah. Like, right. Like that was, it was going to go that way. Did she know all these things? And so the question is always about, did she know? And I, I, I'm starting to think now that the correct question is, is, well, it's, it's not that did she know it's, did she have faith? Yes. Instead, right? Like, you don't have to know. Yes. And I, and I also hate the, I hate when people say things like blind faith or whatever, right? Like, I don't have faith because I am like giving up my intellect and I am just surrendering like, oh, I don't know, like, you know, God's the God of thunder, right? I don't know how it happens, but God, right? That's not faith. It's with no, the evidence no, that I no. have, with all that I do know, I'm choosing to move forward, right? That's faith. So it's like packing a parachute. If if you and I were going to jump out of an airplane and a, you know, you packed my parachute, <laughs> or you you packed parachute one and a, a, a skydiving instructor packed parachute two <laughs> like i'm sorry buddy i want that guy's parachute i want parachute number two yeah right because i know yes that he probably knows well at least i have faith that he did it right right so it's correct, not that correct, mary correct. necessarily knew or even needed to know but it's did she have faith and of course if she's preserved from sin right she's not struggling with these things like you and i would then Correct. she could move forward she with trusts. A faith, yeah a faith greater than abraham's right yeah yeah hmm. i mean this is just amazing theology it really is and so what the what the church the council fathers the the fathers of the second vatican council the conciliar fathers that uh, they present mary to us it, it, in a three-dimensional view. One, Mary as God-bearer. She is, you know, and again, it's about Jesus. Jesus is true God and true man. So Mary as Theotokos. There is a basic, that basic dimension. There is the salvific dimension, which associates Mary with Jesus, in, in, that is in church and salvation history, which is why the Council Fathers put her in this, section having to do with the people of God and the church, because she is part of the people of God, part of the redeemed people. And theologically, this is this is where she belongs. And then the third uh, view of Mary that is presented to us in the documents is what's called cultic, that is veneration, right? Cult means Mary as model. And this is one of the things that the, that the council fathers tell us is that saints are made to be venerated and to be imitated and not just not just venerated but imitated yeah. what is it about mary that i w i want to be like mary yeah. that is true devotion true devotion is imitation right and that's one of the the healthy things about about uh, the the document right and a lot of people respond to it emotionally there's an again it's an emotional kind of a thing like you're taking away mary like no we're not taking away Mary. We're just educating you as to where Mary is in salvation history, where Mary is in relationship to Jesus, right? Um, let me tell you an interesting little anecdote. Yeah. Uh, there was a religious community that asked me to do a novena or give a novena uh, on the Blessed Mother. So I said, sure. So I did... The novena, the way I, you know, like most of my stuff, I, I always start from a historical point of view. So I start from history, church fathers. I covered all the heresies, right, that about Jesus, right, which is really what it's all about. It's about Jesus and Mary's relationship to Jesus. So did all that, and so then I'm there and I'm preaching like, so please, 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 if whatever you do, don't ever say to Jesus through Mary, like, like no. That is wrong. There's only one mediator. That's Jesus. And I said, if you really want to think about it, it's to Mary through Jesus, because it is only through Jesus that we understand who Mary really is, right? So, of course, that freaked out a lot of people. And so at the end of the novena, so I'm there, I'm preaching, and so I get to the end of the novena. So the bishop of the diocese comes to celebrate the last mass uh, of the novena and the big, you know, sol solemn, the blah, blah, blah thing. So he preaches, right? So I gave my homily, and then he, 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 closes, he closes the celebration of the novena with his 
homily, even though he didn't have to <laughs> since I was preaching. Yeah. So what does he start with? To Jesus through Mary. Uh, I was going like, holy. You're like, dang it. <laughs> okay. I'm like, ah. Yeah. So yeah, that's why you need Peretti to teach bishops, basically. So uh, yeah. And it's it's so funny because that that is a really interesting way of thinking about it. But you can even see how somebody could take that the whole point that you can't like Mary only is what she is because of Jesus. So if you say to Mary through yes. Jesus, somebody's gonna go, "What you're putting her above Jesus?" And you're like, "No, <laughs> like stop, <laughs> just you don't listen. Understand. Listen what yeah. I'm saying." Yeah. Oh, people. Yeah. Ah, uh, God's people. So. Then in looking at, at the, again, the, the role of Mary, the importance of Mary in, in the church, then I think what we have to do is you look at, again, original justice, Adam and Eve, right? Then you had the original sin, right? The fall. And then because of the sin, you have concupiscence. You have this fallenness, right? And so this original justice then, this, this state before sin, where there was no pain or no sin. So if Mary then was conceived without original sin, sin then she was, she was born in original justice. She had that clearer trust and faith in God, right? And so one of the things that we have to understand is that Mary's response to God is not... Um, f- it's not forced. It's free. It's like, okay. I try to tell people like, like think of sin, think of sin as illness. So when you're ill, when you're sick, there's certain things that you cannot do physically, right? But when your body is all functioning and and it's, you're free of any illness, you're free of any brokenness, right? Or or even age, right? Uh, Which is again, part of sin. When you're in your prime, let's like when you're in your prime, there is such a freedom and there is such a freedom in your work, in your ability to to be in the world and do these different things. And so that's what Mary's soul was like in the original state. There was such freedom and strength and her ability then to respond to God's will. And so then we accept that that Mary had has no original sin she was never defeated by the evil one or by sin and so part of it is then is that mary then again as the council fathers present her she is also like the icon of the church she represents us and so in her representation of us what we celebrate in her as i said earlier is that we are celebrating our own future to be realized yet, but is already realized in Mary. And this is something for us to to think about. Um, We see in Scripture that she surrenders willingly to this petition from God the Father. The angel brings her the message, right? And she goes like, because she's she's in original justice, she goes like, okay, I don't know how you can do this, but I trust that I have faith that God has always been faithful and trustworthy. So yeah, I'm sure you're You'll take care of it, right? Yeah. And so just that attitude is like, what? It's amazing. Yeah. So this is something for us again. And even even her think about. even her questioning, right? Because like if you and I were presented with some kind of, you know, heavenly, you know, possibility from an angel and we start going, wait, how? How do you want to do that? <laughs> like we're coming yes. from a different place than Mary would have when yes. she questioned. Right, because it wasn't like I'm questioning right. an opposition, right? She's questioning. Right, like, I don't know how that's going to happen, but faith. okay, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And one of the things for us then, as as believers in the world right now, to to think of Mary as as a praying disciple, because after the crucifixion, she's in the upper room with the apostles, praying. That again, that's faith. That's that's trust that's that's confidence right and that's something that we need to 
continuously remember that that is that is what I'm supposed to be imitating is her prayerful trust and faith, right? And so we have to move away from a lot of these things. Like again, that question that did Mary know? Did Mary know? Right? I try to watch. I don't watch. Just like I don't listen to Christian music because it's terrible. <laughs> I don't watch. I don't watch very many religious shows because most religious shows are really terrible too theologically. Yeah. So I tried to watch one once. There was one thing that came out several years ago, and it was on TV. So I was watching it, and so. Um, Somebody says something to Jesus about Joseph, his father, right? About Joseph, right? And then Jesus turns to Mary and says, so like, my father, kind of like, wink, wink, we know better. And I go like, holy, <laughs> what? <laughs> so I just, I just, I just had to turn it off. I go, like, I, this just, I'm disgusted. I just need to walk away. I just can't, I can't know that it's so wrong, right? Yeah. Um. So we have to be careful about these uh, skewed understandings <sighs> of Mary, whether she had full knowledge or preternatural knowledge or all those things. Like, like, it doesn't matter. She had faith. That's what counts. She had faith. Yeah. Um, we, we're uh, I'm trying to remember where, where we were even in, in, in this. We're talking about justice and sin. Um. But you had said something, and I can't. You said something about um, age, like getting old and dying, like that's a result of sin, which goes to Mary's um, assumption. And so I guess I don't know if, if right. We'll, we can get to there, but like I wonder then if she if she still aged, you know, or if her aging was even maybe different, or I don't know. It was probably different. Yeah, I mean, she still lived in the world, right? She was she was preserved from sin, but she 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 had, she grew up, right? Yeah. So she grew. She well, she didn't she so and just as Jesus did, you know, he grew. But I think the aging process and the whole the whole understanding of death would be different within original justice, right? Yeah. Or or within that that being free from original sin, right? It would be different. And, and so, again, this is, again, there's a lot of speculation here, right? So we don't, we won't know until we get to to, to the other side and we can ask Mary how, exactly how it was. <laughs> uh, but, again, you have to be careful not to, not to over-speculate because that's not what this is about. What this yeah. is about is the iconic or the, the prophetic uh, image of Mary as church yeah church victorious church immaculate church glorious right so let me close with this with this that there's some criteria for an authentic marian devotion as laid down by the second vatican council and for people to think about right there's only three points one my marian devotion must be theologically based. That is, it must have sound backing from Scripture, and the ramifications of the particular Marian stance cannot contradict already accepted theological truths. It must be seen within the Trinitarian and Christological context. In other words, Mary is not bigger than God. Two, it must lead to a deeper knowledge of Mary. That is, it is to help the faithful by showing the depth and breadth of Mary's role as disciple of Jesus within the context of the church community. Thirdly, and most importantly, it should lead to imitation. After the above two criteria are met, the particular exposition of a Marian stance should be an encouragement to the faithful to imitate Mary's faith life as disciple of Jesus. There's a lot more, but, you know, we don't have time to do 12 episodes on Mary. Yeah. So. And, and and who knows, maybe maybe there, there'll be something, something will come up, right? And we can come back. But that's... Yeah. 
Yeah, because just like so many other aspects of the church, you could, I mean, I guarantee you, you can go look out there and there's a podcast just about Mary. It's, it is the Mary podcast or something, you know? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I just think all this is so beautiful and it really, it does. I like that you, there's something that you always say, Father, is like when you're reading the, um, if you're doing the, 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 what's it called? I keep wanting to say Vatican because we were talking about the, uh, Vatican too. Um, what the heck is the thing called? Catechism. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you're listening to the catechism in a year, right? Or you're listening to one of these episodes that you and I do. And there's something that interests you. You are always, you always very gently put the responsibility of learning more back on the person, right? So don't just like check the box listening to the catechism of the year when something really tugs at you like go learn like yes go teach yourself yeah go dig into it and pray and let it let it sit with you and you sit with it and see what happens and i think that's something that these last two conversations that we've just had about mary i think are something that um they definitely give you a lot to think about. And it's, it's kind of no wonder too. It makes me also think about St. Joseph, right? There's very, very mm-hmm. little scripturally about St. Joseph, but if you understand who Jesus is, then you yep. can learn probably a lot about who Joseph was. About Joseph. Exactly. Exactly. He is, he is the model and the image of the father that Jesus had in his natural human Sacred humanity, his human life, right? Yeah. Some, uh, somebody told me once, and we can end it with this, poor Joseph. They said, how would you like to be in that that house? Because if anything ever went wrong, there was only one person whose fault, whose fault? could have been. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Mary or Jesus. Oh, poor Joseph. So <laughs> I'm going to ask Joseph for praise because <laughs> I feel like that's the same thing. He understands. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Father, thank you so much for for doing this. And uh, maybe we'll revisit again. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, Yeah, I'm sure. Good stuff. All right. And everyone who, who joined in, thanks for joining us. We can't wait to see you next time. God bless everybody. God bless.